Welcome to Electric Liberty Land here on the Lions of Liberty podcast, your weekly shot of culture, comedy, and liberty with your host, Brian McWilliams. What's happening, Buttercups? Welcome to the show. Welcome to Electric Liberty Land. I am your host, Brian McWilliams, as always, here to bring you delights of which you're probably unfamiliar. You probably will never experience outside of my voice. Listen to my other ASMR podcast, right? Who's <laughs> to describe sexual acts. No, just kidding, guys. Welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me. Please be sure to subscribe. Please to be sure to tell a friend. Please to be sure to give us a five-star review on iTunes and all that good stuff. Go and post about us as your favorite podcast out there and help us. Help us help you. And uh, before we get into the show proper, guys, I want to tell you about a new sponsor of ours, Drom. Now, I know it's hard to pronounce. You probably are not Swedish, but Drom, D-R-O-M, is a new dating app basically designed to supersede and eviscerate all of the other sucky dating apps that exist out there. Now, yes, you may have heard I met my wife on a dating website, but of course, you know how these dating websites work. It's a lot of matchmaking. It's a lot of percentages of people and what you match here and what you match there. And it's a lot of swiping and this and that and the other one. But Drome actually goes and tries to put you together with people that you authentically match with. So you're not going to get stuck with those awkward situations where if you're a libertarian, your economic views, your political views, uh, your whatever they might be, your views on COVID, probably don't coincide with a lot of what is out there in the population. But this app, which you can find at DROM dot date forward slash lions make sure you use that and you can use promo code lions to come right in download it to your phone type it in your browser download right to your phone get that app for free what's cool about this is you can develop your own matchmaking within the system kind of like hashtagging so if you don't find something that's akin to what you like already you can actually input your own that other people can find right and you know, creating those hashtags is anonymous at first you can't see who created the hashtag you know necessarily so it's not going to be traced back and there's not gonna be a witch hunt coming after you but you can still meet people by that hashtagging what you like libertarian liberty freedom uh, free association free minds free markets whatever it might be and other people can find you through that if you can't find them. Check this out, very cool stuff, guys. Drome, D-R-O-M dot date forward slash lions. Give it a go. Hopefully you get nice and good and laid and uh, you know really start a movement of your own, a little baby libertarian movement. Um, the other thing I wanna talk about just real quick is our Patreon. Of course, you can join it, you can get in, you can get discounts on all of our merchandise by joining at the link patreon.com forward slash lions of liberty. We have started posting content on locals uh, locals.com as well. Just go and search for Lions of Liberty. We'll pop right up. And I've been posting my rants there. We're starting to upload and get that brand built out. So if you hate Patreon, which I know a lot of you do, and you're on Locals, you can support us there through that platform. All right. On to the show. Um, been a long day. I'll tell you that. I'm kind of a little bit out of it today. I, uh, I had a lot of work to do for my real career. The thing that actually pays me real money. And like the, the pittance that I suffer for to bring you guys my aspect of the world through the Liberty lens. But um, yeah, man, I'm tired, but you know what I'm even more tired of is having a circular discussion with people about vaccines, like the one I had this past weekend with two people I love, you know, my cousin and his husband, uh, I went and visited them, but again, had a very circular discussion about vaccines, wherein, you know, the old, it's become a real trope at this point, almost cliche, this circular logic of you must get vaccinated even though you can still transmit it when you're vaccinated, even though you can still contract it when you're vaccinated, and even though we have ample examples of breakthrough cases. I was just looking today, of course, the news that the Pfizer vaccine is fully FDA, FDA approved broke. I'm going to come back to that. But I also was reading an article in the Daily Beast. Not necessarily a publication that I would consider right-leaning, not one that I would consider to be in any way conservative. If anything, it is highly super liberal. But the Daily Beast is also showcasing that Israel, one of the most vaccinated populations in the entire world, and predominantly with Pfizer as a vaccine, which of course is the one that just got approved, they are seeing a crisis of people catching COVID that are 
double vaccinated, people that were the elderly population that had been sometimes triple vaccinated. You know, they're talking about people who had kidney failures and kidney diseases. So they had these people at the forefront of who's going to get the vaccines. And yet you still see these people getting sick. You still see the breakthrough cases. You still see everything else. Now, Israel's blaming the Delta variant getting into the country because they had opened the borders and allowed people to travel over the holidays. Maybe. Then again, I don't know. Maybe it's just that this thing is a virus. And even if you close your borders, you're still going to be bordering other countries. There's still winds. There's still uh, people getting things touched that are transmitted. I mean, to try to imagine, again, I'm no epidemiologist, but I can't think of a way in which a virus is really going to be stopped unless you are doing, you know, like even New Zealand's example of we're going to lock down the entire country, we're going to close the borders, no ships in or out, you know, where they might be doing. And I don't know if they're stopping shipments in. I'm guessing that's part of it, part and parcel. So uh, I don't know. Hopefully they have enough sheep left to, uh, to slaughter and have sex with over there. But unless you're going to have this insane draconian response when you're shutting down all society, which seems like something that is even far more detrimental, far more damaging and, uh, and absolutely insane compared to adapting, overcoming, as we have done as a human population throughout history, to something like this virus. I don't see how you're going to stop it, especially if you have bordering nations that are landlocked or that share a common boundary. So we see Israel saying, oh, well, it's because of this travel, yet they have adapted their viewpoints, as I talked about in other episodes like the UK, like in Norway, like in any country where we aren't simply sold on this authoritarian narrative and the incentives that are enriched with that narrative. And I'll get back to that in a moment as well. We're seeing people finally change their viewpoint. And this is something where it must be out of necessity because all scientific emphasis to the contrary has failed miserably. Israel is now saying, look, we're not going to shut down again. We're not going to lock down again. Even though we have these breakthrough cases, even though we have all of these hundreds of people that are now going into the ICU, the elderly that we thought would be safe from this, that we were promised would be safe from this, that we demanded everybody go kowtow to the line and get vaccinated in order to go out the, their, their daily business, we can no longer do that. We can't push this any longer. Now we have to accept that oh, it's just going to be here. Now, this is something we should have accepted from the get-go. And yes, there is evidence to show that a natural vaccinated person, or I'm sorry, somebody that is vaccinated compared to somebody that has an immunity built up with antibodies from having contracted the virus. I forget the exact name of it. Uh, it was something that I was surprised was the actual name for people that survived the virus. But compared to people that are survivors of the virus, they are showing that people who have naturally survived it do have a higher level of immunity compared to the vaccinated. For example, your ability to can, you know, maintain those antibodies lasts a vastly longer time than does the boosters that are required for the vaccine that tend to fade over a couple of months rather than you know something like eight months compared to people that have natural immunity. Now, getting back around to this vaccine being approved. You know, you'd think that it would be a good thing. You'd think that it would be a breath of fresh air to those of us who are saying, look, I don't really have an interest in getting the vaccine. Now, for me, I don't have much of an interest in it for several reasons. Number one, I am 99.9% .9 positive I already had COVID. I got real sick. My wife got real sick. She also sends a taste and smell. I had a bad cough for a few weeks, got over it, feel fine, right? As did she. Why would I go and get this, this vaccine then? Equal chance of getting ill again. And now with Delta, why not? You know, why, why bother if I'm just going to catch it again anyway? And there doesn't seem to be any tangible benefit for a person of my age and health status. So <laughs> getting back to this vaccine being, being approved, though. Sorry, I'm getting off of tangents. And I'm trying to keep myself on target here. You'd think this would be a good thing because then you'd say, okay, for all of, the, all of us that are saying we don't want to get vaccinated, well, there's no more excuse, right? And this is what the people in the media are saying. This is what uh, I'm sure my relatives would argue. There's no reason now because you people were simply delaying based upon this being an experimental vaccine, right? And there is ample information to show that RMNA, or MRNA, sorry, vaccines, they have been researching these for years. I'm not, you know, I don't think any of us were arguing that this is something they pulled out of a hat and suddenly put into being. But that being said, it still was sped through. But overall, 
that's what we want predominantly, right? As people that view the FDA as pretty much standing in the way of a lot of progress, we should cheer things being pushed together, uh, pushed through faster as long as they're safe, before they, you know, as long as the efficacy is proven. Now, I've raised the problem that the side effects are not being advertised to people as such, and in fact are being censored, being quashed by the mainstream media, being quashed by social media platforms. Anything that it goes contrary to the mainstream narrative that this is safe and effective is pretty much pushed to the wayside and you're threatened with being removed from your social media platforms, dare you to question it. And to a next extent, you have to wonder what's going on behind the curtains of social media with the extremism movements. Uh, the government has already tried to paint people that oppose vaccination and oppose the narrative on COVID as being extremists likely to, uh, to attack the government. That is from an FBI document that was re uh, revealed to the public. But when we look at this, this objection, right, it's become far more than just about getting a vaccine based upon the safety of the vaccine. At this point, I think many of us would simply refuse to get it if we weren't in that category where we're highly susceptible to dying from COVID. We would simply push back because it has now become more political than scientific. It has become such a authoritarian impulse that we look at what this is putting into place from a societal level. Right, from a base presumption, we look at what they've been doing here. We're, we're looking at the amount of time, the amount of money that has been put into the development of vaccine passports, right? And this was supposedly from the Biden administration saying, oh, well, we're working with private institutions and the governments aren't gonna be controlling these things. But <laughs> at the end of the day, who's controlling them? The governments are. Who's rolling them out? Your state governments, your city governments, whatever they might be. Even though we were working with private companies and supposedly this was only gonna be in the hands of the private institutions, private business owners for their own safety, we see how they're being applied. You see they're being applied to all public transportation. You see they're being required for all public health workers, for all people that are working in the military now, for all people that are working in public schooling, on and on and on. You see how they're tying it into Medicare and Medicaid, they're tying it into all healthcare workers and basically threatening these people's jobs, threatening the funding that these organizations can receive from the government if they do not comply. So you see how much time and money has been put into building up this system wherein these vaccine passports exist. And now there is a added incentive to use them. And that's what it comes down to for me is that we're opposing this layering of incentives that now is put into place and the precedent that it's set for future applications. Right, just like the Supreme Court goes into precedent when they view a case, they say, okay, what law in the past can we reference? What finding in the past, what caseload in the past can we look at to say, oh, well, there's some precedent set for this. It was done this way in the past, so let's go ahead and follow that route in the future. And COVID has been a massive exercise in developing precedent for authoritarianism, for health fascism, as I have, and several others have called it, by virtue of establishing the passports, establishing a system wherein you can and can't enter your house, leave your house, enter a country, leave a country, go into a place of business, run a place of business, make a profit, all the while subsisting on government funding. So who benefits from this? Well, obviously the authoritarian governments in, in existence, which is virtually every government in existence. We've seen the infrastructure build out that comes with all of this the build out of the people working on the healthcare vaccine passports, the build out of the people going door to door that are examining and, and pushing these vaccines, the build out of all the people that are dependent on the vaccine industry now. I look at the incentives of the elites, just like with the military industrial complex, who are heavily invested in pharma. And so many of them are, or so many of them get paid out with these massive government lobby bucks to push forward vaccine technology, to push forward boosters into the public consciousness as something that we are always going to depend on. And that's where I think this concept of boosters, right? And Anthony Fauci, God King Fauci is out there saying, well, people should get used to having boosters several times a year. No shit. I think we all predicted that this was going to be the natural outcome of all this because from a pharmaceutical perspective, right? There's different ways. And I've worked with the pharma industry in my public relations career before. There's different designations. There's different ways that these companies make money. Vaccines and this technology probably is one of the cheaper ways that they can create something that the population now is being forced to adopt ongoing 
never ending. And by virtue of working hand in hand with the government, more than any other time I could see in, in history that I can think of, at least in my own history. I mean, there are the vaccines for polio and measles and bumps, but those are one-time things. Typically all the vaccines you get are one-time things. But this new collaboration with government, now where they're getting government funding to pay for these shots, they're getting government funding to advertise these shots. I mean, can you think of a time in the past in which big pharma was literally getting advertised by government everywhere? And not only by government, but by corporations jumping on board, unaffiliated corporations, bars, corporations, telling you to mask up, telling you to get vaccinated. Government bucks spent to fund one of the largest corporate groups, one of the largest lobbying groups that has ever existed in the history of the world, and a group that controls a lot of people's futures insofar as their health data, their health ability, their ability to, to get products and, and goods that they need to keep themselves alive. So quite interesting the way this is rolling out. But you look also, again, how they're developing this system. Instead of having these, these drugs that have a very specific portion of the population, right? Let's say cancer survivors or people that are afflicted with cancer or people that are afflicted with, uh, with some sort of genetic disease or afflicted with God knows what. That's a small portion of the population in comparison to the vast billions that roam the planet. Isn't it pretty obvious which way they're going to go? especially with all the government emphasis on this, especially with all the government backing. I mean, they're putting into place a system wherein it is almost like a perpetual motion machine of money making, of influence making, of power. Because not only are they making money off of it, but now if people become dependent on these, it's gonna weaken our immune systems overall, right? Because we're not naturally fighting them off anymore. They're helping to support and subsist the uh, human immune system, which I think is highly dangerous, by the way. I think making sure that the entire population is injected with a strain of virus is unbelievably dangerous just from a human perspective of overcoming, adapting our natural immune systems and variations between different people and different populations as far as coming together and overcoming something. If you're mass injecting everybody, you are putting us in danger. But that aside, now you have this system in place wherein we now are constantly going to be, uh, you know, relying on these boosters every day. It's becoming a psychological thing even, where people are gonna to look to these boosters as the only way they're gonna stay alive. That is a powerful drug, if you'll excuse this stupid reference, that's a powerful drug, a powerful aphrodisiac for the government to have, for a big pharma to have, to know that they now not only have control of you as far as your health, but now psychological control of you. And don't be fooled by any of this going on. This has been psychological warfare they have been waging against you from the get-go. Whether or not you believe that COVID is in fact dangerous, and we can see people died of it, it's debatable how many excess deaths there were compared to people that would have died anyway. And the numbers even now with the Delta variant, I was just reading a paper in the UK, they're saying that some 43% of the people that they are saying are in the hospital for COVID didn't come into the hospital for COVID. They came with any number of other maladies entering the ICUs and then got diagnosed with COVID because they are in this environment where half the people have COVID and it's a highly transmissible disease. So then they get nose swabbed and ta-da, COVID. We're overrun with COVID patients. So getting back to it. You have this aphrodisiac, you have this incentive to nonstop condition the population to believe that this is a never ending crisis, similar to, again, similar to the war on terror, similar to any other existential crisis that the government convinces the population that they have to fund, that they have to fear, and that the government is the only cure for. And they have positioned COVID as something that only governments can cure because it is so prolific. It is everywhere that these sons of bitches draw upon it like the force in the fucking Star Wars. They draw upon it like the emperor to leech out all your tax dollars, to apply them into converting your fear into their benefit, their totalitarian, totalitarian future, their ability to psychologically manipulate and control you from here on through eternity. And you see that in the way that data is coming out. You see that the way the censorship and working with social media has been applied. You see that in the way that that even your everyday people, your relations with your families have been destroyed. The government is to blame for that. COVID's not to blame. Your bodily choice isn't to blame for that. 
your government is to blame for destroying your family relationships, for destroying your friend relationships, for forcing you into a corner wherein you almost feel that you have to fight against what now maybe will be proven to be sound science from the vaccine standpoint, but because of what it brings with it. And what it brings with it is an authoritarian future, vaccine passports, and the precedent that whenever another one of these viruses come out, we will be mandated to get vaccines and boosters and mandated to have vaccine passports and mandated to share our, share our healthcare data and mandated to be culpable, to be available to whatever government stooge decides to come along and get in the way of our freedom, of our ability to operate. That's the big fucking problem here. And that's what I said with, you know, this FDA, they basically have FDA approved totalitarianism. That's what has come from this. And that is just absolutely terrifying. Another thing I just saw, by the way, um, the Florida doctors, while we're on this COVID kick, because, of course, Florida, and you'd imagine probably a lot of the doctors in Florida are probably more liberal in their thinking, more liberal in their bent. But these people staged a big old walkout. Not all day, by the way. And yes, there was a lot of a lot of haranguing, a lot of uh, people saying, well, these doctors should be ashamed of themselves. And I agree. I agree they should. They should be ashamed of themselves for walking out and refusing to treat their patients. The mainstream media, of course, didn't tell you. They walked out for about five minutes and then walked right back in. Like many of these other things, it was more for show than for any substance. And as I said before, I have a hard time really accepting that the Delta variant, and they're saying that the people that are going to the ICU are unvaccinated, which goes against what everything that's happening in Israel, right? So all the talking points saying that these are all unvaccinated people makes me wonder when we have empirical evidence from another country that is the most vaccinated country out there that this is not true. And also <laughs> it raises an interesting question as to whether being vaccinated, and this is what I was referring to earlier when I said this is a dangerous precedent to say everyone gets the same vaccine for the same variant, whether or not having a vaccinated population to this extent actually helps drive mutation and drives a further uh, evolution of a virus that is more deadly and is more easily transmissible, which is the way that viruses constantly work, constantly operate to stay alive. They become more easily transmissible while becoming less deadly. And you are seeing the deaths tend to be down. They're saying the deaths tend to be in the unvaccinated or people that are in the ICU. I'm still not seeing a giant spike in deaths compared to I don't know, a lot of different places before, a lot like the original spikes, you're seeing a massive number of cases because of the transmissibility of this and because it's crossing borders. But you do wonder, are more boosters going to cause more mutations? Are more mutations going to lead to a virus a variant that, even though they typically get weaker, might be deadlier, might have a, a leap across to where our dogs are killing over faster? I mean, these are the worries that I have. But sorry, getting back to these Florida doctors, a lot of showboating. Which just, you know, it's just, it's one of those things where I'm so fucking sick of the show putting. I'm so sick of the emotion and the emoting and the grandstanding that's attached to everything COVID now, where you see people going out of their way to shame others, going out of their way to cross these, to cause these grand gestures they know are going to be misconstrued, misread, and misrepresented by the media, but they do them anyway because we are in a masturbatory society, especially with COVID, wherein you're proving your. I don't know, your vigilance, your virtue, I mean, virtue signaling by stepping out and denying your patient's care for five minutes, setting a terrible precedent for doctors and then the media reports coming out saying, well, these doctors are refusing to treat their patients. What if some doctors actually do refuse to treat their patients? What if people do start denying people that have COVID treatment because they didn't get the vaccine early enough? They don't know why they opted not to. They don't know what their conditions were before that. But because they want a virtue signal, because they feel that they did everything they could, that these people should be denied treatment. How do you, how would you expand that into healthcare? How do you expand that into a broader consciousness as far as eating right, exercising, smoking, not smoking, going for a walk every day? Are doctors just going to stop treating people that don't, don't eat a salad for every fourth meal of the day? Are they going to stop treating people who decide that they want to have a little sugar after dinner? This is the insidious nature and the concern with universal healthcare, number one, but the insidious nature of how this virtue signaling, how this top-down authoritarian mentality 
that's being instilled in us through this, again, like I said before, through this psychological warfare that the government has put onto us that is driving and dividing people, they are instilling this into all of us. And it probably will make it that much easier to expand that into a universal healthcare environment and force people into living a certain way, force states into removing certain items off the shelves, cigarettes, sodas, cupcakes, whatever it might be, whatever the government decides isn't good enough for you. And you then are going to be selfish. One of the favorite phrases that people use during this entire thing, you'll be selfish if you don't go along with it and your individuality be damned, your freedoms be damned and your personal choices be damned. Now, one thing, guys, I can tell you, a good personal choice would be would be to go and visit our friends over at PalomaVerdeCBD.com. This is a company run by two libertarians that founded it because they wanted to provide you with the best, the most uh, pure, the most delicious CBD products out there on the marketplace. I know Mark's gotten a great shipment, still isn't shared with me because he's a scumbag, but tinctures, you know, they've got rubs, they've got salves for you, pure THC, to, I'm sorry, not THC, pure CBD, excuse me, to take care of your angst and pains, to help you sleep better, to help your, uh, you know, like I was saying before, I've had issues with my muscles four days, four years, for uh, forevermore. And Paloma Verde CBD has everything you need to apply that to make yourself feel a little bit better, to get your good sleep, to wake up refreshed in the morning and go about your day. Now, you can use promo code LIONS to get 25% off your order of $75 or more, and they always have free shipping. So visit them now, palomaverdecbd.com, P-A-L-O-M-A-V-E-R-D-E-C-B-D.com. Make sure to use that code LIONS, get 25% off $75 or more, free shipping. Bam. Okay, coming back into it. Um, I think I want to just a couple more, a couple more quick stories on COVID. I know we're all sick of COVID, but in the midst of this FDA approval, I had to talk about it. Um, in France, businesses are refusing to enforce the vaccine passport. Not only in France, but I'm also reading about that people are pushing back, restaurateurs and other business owners are pushing back here in the US. That's a great thing. But the reason they're pushing back is not only for political reasons, not only for the principles of freedom and liberty, but out of self-interest. One of the greatest drivers of society, one of the greatest drivers of innovation and freedom has always been self-interest. Now, granted, it's why the government's so evil, but it's why the rest of us can be so good and why, as, uh, what was it, in <laughs> Wall Street, Gecko said, greed is good. Yes, greed is good. And self-interest is good. And I was reading an article here in the United States from someone I believe was in Manhattan, essentially saying, look, it's not my problem and not my, it's not my job to enforce your vaccine passports. As a, as a business owner, it's not my job to ask anybody if they've been vaccinated, if their health choices are in line with mine or with yours as a state mandated government. It's not my position to ask a woman that's pregnant why she decided to forego an injection that we know has had some side effects and has caused some pregnancies before. Why would I put myself in that position? I serve pizza. I'm making meatballs, you know, whatever it might be. Why should I step up and put myself not only into somebody's private health decisions, not the job coming out of restaurant management school or whatever it might be, not the job I signed up for, but also on top of that, why would I put myself more in dangerous way? Because you think about it, you don't know how people are going to react, how, how unpredictable people are. Maybe from that moment on, even though they understand, well, this is a decision that's been passed down. This poor guy is just trying to enforce a ridiculous and unconstitutional government mandate. Well, maybe they don't really give a shit that he's just trying to do his job to the best of his ability to stay open. Maybe now they boycott that restaurant. And I've heard libertarians say they're going to boycott any place that requires it. This has been a, a movement to try to influence business owners to reject state mandates. So now this guy's lost a customer for life. How many more is he going to lose? Because the thing is, I doubt you're going to gain a lot. We take, think about what you know about people that op opt in for government mandates that are the ones that are on the forefront of shaming you for not getting the vaccine. Does they, they seem like the type of people that are going to go out of their way to reward and recognize the people that are going along with state mandates that they view as common sense good? Well, that would be stupid, right? That would be akin to, 
uh, saying, good job for crossing the street during the green light, guy, right? Oh, these leftists, these, these people that accept the vaccine mandates, they don't care about that. To them, it's what everybody should be doing and be forced to be doing anyway. So you're just doing what's right for the common good. So there's no benefit for you, but there's a fuck ton of drawback and risk, and your business is more likely to suffer from that than gain. So that's one thing to think about. And it's interesting to see these people voicing this. I'm curious to see, I thought this would happen before and it didn't, if restaurant lobbyists get together and you know basically form a class action lawsuit. I'm shocked it hasn't happened yet. It is actually is heartbreaking to me that it hasn't happened yet. The groups of restaurateurs have not gotten together to sue the federal government, to get together to protest as we've seen in other cities. I know Italy, they refused to shut down during the lockdowns. They refused to enforce any sort of vaccine passports there. And you actually let restaurant owners in the street, in mass together. You haven't seen that here. Maybe, maybe we had better bailouts here, but considering the fact that something like one third of the restaurants have already closed in the country and are unlikely to reopen, I don't know. I certainly think you'd see more activity. But good news, my favorite Chinese buffet here in Los Angeles just reopened. I went there yesterday. God bless them. So glad to see those bastards back. And let's see, the last thing. Oh, no, that was it. I already talked about the fact that the uh, the hospital patients in England, like I said, something like 43% of them have been uh, diagnosed as coming in for a different reason and then catching COVID. Uh, one quick thing, and then I will uh, go on to some other topics, is I wanted to tell you guys I'm going to be taking part. Well, number one, you heard my fantastic interview last week with Federico Fernandez from the Austrian Center. Go to austrianconference.org. If you want to find out more, if you want to submit a paper, or if you just want to come drink with me in Vienna, Austria at this conference, we're going to be doing a live podcast there with some of the bigger attendees that are going to be speaking. It's going to be an awesome time, guys. You're in the cradle of Austrian economics. I'm excited as hell for it. I hope you will come out, buy a ticket, come join me, or get involved. Like I said, you can still submit papers at austrianconference.org. And then also I'm going to be speaking at the L.A. Bastiat Society, which is through uh, AEIR. That's going to be September 10th. So if you're in the L.A. area, you can get tickets for that. It's free on Eventbrite. Just look up L.A. Bastiat Society or go through uh, through AEIR's page and you can find information about that. Again, September 10th. Uh, it's going to be a fun time. I'm going to uh, make them buy me a good bottle of liquor, get all liquored up and talk about how we're going to be branding what I think are the, the most potential potentially breakthrough topics in reaching people in libertarian thinking for 2021. And also I'm I might get a little bit into something I've been thinking about in which a friend just asked me uh, actually this past weekend about, uh, which is the libertarian solution to homelessness. And I have some thoughts on that. I have uh, some things that I've been putting together and I actually think that might be a component of what I'm talking about here too. Because if there's one thing we can all agree on in Los Angeles and in many of these big cities, it's that homelessness is a big fucking problem. And I think I have some pretty good ideas about it. We need to talk about solutions. We can't just bitch about things any longer. It's not working. All right. Uh, oh, and then one more thing. Sacramento, guys, the Mises Caucus uh, and the uh, I'm sorry, the L.A. County of uh, L.A. <laughs> Libertarian Party of Sacramento. Sorry, there we go. Uh, LPSAC, LPSAC.org. They're going to be put together a 9-11 benefit uh, slash rally. It is a Bring Our Troops Home rally with Adam Kokesh, Jeff Hewitt, who, of course, is running for governor here in Los Angeles and is a Riverside County supervisor, supervisor and Angela McArdle. They're going to add in some more speakers to that, but that's going to be up in, uh, let's see, Libertarian Party of Sacramento and the LP Mises, Mises Caucus of California. That is going to be up in the Capitol at Sacramento starting at 10 a.m. So check that out as well. All right, get back into it. Fun fact, we're seeing all the media coverage talk about Afghanistan. We're seeing very little media coverage talk about how we shouldn't have been in Afghanistan for anywhere near 20 years. We're seeing a lot of hand-wringing about how Joe Biden handled this. We're seeing a lot of finger-pointing at Joe Biden for pulling out too soon and not asking the simple question of why the fuck we were in Afghanistan for 20 years and what we did over the past 20 years that apparently was completely ineffective with very little internal questioning of 
whether or not warfare is an effective, I don't know what you call it, an effective tool for change in countries that we want to influence, nor why we're trying to influence countries like Afghanistan that really have almost nothing to do with us and virtually zero influence on our daily lives other than 9-11, which I don't want to discount that. It was a horrible event. But I would say an aberration of aberrations that was caused by the United States being involved in what we're doing in Afghanistan, but in a greater scale across the Middle East and across Africa. So we don't want to question too much, right, and defend the military industrial complex as to the efficacy of any of these actions, how we're creating problems rather than solutions there. Instead, we just want to talk about what a boondoggle it is today. However, despite all that media coverage, right, the media coverage right now, the fact that we were there for 20 years must have gotten pretty boring for the media, must have gotten a little bit old. Don't want to talk about the failures on the ground there or the government by virtue of having so many people, CIA operatives, former FBI heads, former heads of the NSA as talking heads on all these networks and also influencers in the decision making of these networks and just basically passing down what they want or what they don't want to these news networks that take the CIA or any other internal secret service operative uh, word for it. Well, they just decided they're not going to cover Afghanistan for the most part. There's a report that came out that said the three major networks divided, devoted five minutes to Afghanistan in 2020. All right. Five minutes in 2020 to coverage of Afghanistan before this it came out. Now, this is from Responsible Statecraft, which I'm a big fan of. But yeah, CBS, ABC, NBC, out of 14,000 plus minutes of national evening news, a total of five minutes was to Afghanistan. Now, like I was telling you, that doesn't surprise me. It doesn't surprise me that we also hear virtually nothing about the efforts in Africa. We hear nothing about the efforts in almost any part of the country where, or part of any country where we are in and where things aren't going smashingly well. But even if they are going well, you still don't really hear that much about them because they don't want you to know just how much money, time, uh, killing is done in the name of American interests. Because we here at home aren't affected by it. And if anything, it would behoove the government to just let these things get swept under the rug. The more money that's spent dropping bombs, drone bombing people where the media doesn't report it, well, the better for the government, right? Keep us happy, keep us safe, right? That's what they're saying. They're keeping us happy. Keep us in the dark as to the killing being done. Keep us in the dark as to the enemies that are being created. Keep us in the dark as to what amount of influence the military industrial complex is having on our policies and most importantly, keep us all in the dark as to the number of places we're taking actions in. Afghanistan, at least there's a reason to be there, right? Apparently, these people had taken in some of the attackers from 9-11, right? We thought that they were all from there. It turns out they were mostly from places we were allied with at the time. But at least there was a reason. There was a tangible reason that we were there. I can't name any tangible reasons for us being in places like Somalia uh, or, or any of the other numerous countries in Africa that we're currently inhabiting. I mean, it's hard to argue that we should be in any of like, I think it's something like 35 different countries we're in right now with active operations, be they secret military, be they the Delta Force, be they just troop deployments, be they quote unquote terror war deployments, or should they be simply providing backup like we do in uh, Yemen? for the Saudi army, whether that is providing drones and dropping bombs for people, just killing willy nilly, like we love to do sometimes. It, been, it really does benefit the government to keep us in the dark as far as this goes. So you ask yourself the question, is the government complicit with the media and covering this up? Is this more conspiracy theory? Is this more of a cover up than we like to think? Because any rational journalist would look to the actions, look to warfare. Warfare used to be the biggest news ever. Every night you cover wherever we were at war. American soldiers dying, our boys overseas bleeding red. For your interest as an American population, it seems, and maybe Barack Obama ruined this because the news media is predominantly left. And Barack Obama, he was obviously a very left guy that expanded our arenas of war pretty momentously. None of them declared, mind you, but just covert operations and such. 
He also set a fantastic precedent as far as, and so did George W. Bush, but as far as media going in and out of the circles, right? You get a job in media, they hire you to work at the White House, you go back to the media circle, having now been influenced by government, basically becoming a tool of that government. But you can tell yourself that you're a real journalist, right? Like CNN does, an apple's an apple. Well, to you, an apple's an apple, except you are now rotten to the core. So that apple you're presenting has to be rotten. But... You keep telling yourself that that is a crisp, bright apple that you're presenting to the populace, that nothing's wrong with it, that no one's taking a giant bite out of it in the background to make you influence what you're reporting on. But I find it pretty fascinating. I find it to be a pretty good indicator of just how in bed and intertwined government and big media have become. And they are virtually indistinguishable from each other insofar as the reporting, insofar as the fact checking, insofar as what's believed, insofar as believing anonymous sources all the time and reporting them from spooks that work for the government and spoon feeding the American population. Or deciding not to relay information, nor ask questions. Uh, two more things, then I'm going to wrap it up. A California judge just overturned the, basically, let me give you a little background. Uber, Lyft, all these other places, you know, DoorDash, whatever these gig economy jobs were in California, the California dipshits, right, the people in the Senate had pushed this thing called AB5. They put it in the law. People hated it. It essentially said that if you're a gig economy worker, that now you're a full-time employee. So instead of being able to drive Uber on your own schedule, when you want, sign on, sign off, and make the money that you're working during those hours, AB5 said, and again, this is progressives pushing unionist bullshit, now you're a full-time employee. Now, what they wanted from that is to generate people being full-time employees as they would unionize, that then would kiss their Democratic asses and vote for them come next election because they gave them this great gift of forcing companies into paying them like full-time workers. This has a predictable outcome in that you basically have destroyed the business model of Uber, DoorDash, Lyft, any other delivery place. It would be like, you know, it's basically forcing them into drastically slashing their staff down because the astronomical costs of providing everyone health care, uh, a 401k, a full-time benefits of this, that, and the other, a minimum salary of X, rather than allowing to come on and off at their own rate, they would either have to slash their salary or slash their, uh, their employee numbers drastically, which is what ended up happening, or ramp up the costs, which also ended up happening. Because if you have less drivers, the cost per driver goes up. There's less cars on the road. There's less opportunity. So what AB5 did was fuck over the population of California that was benefiting by virtue of people voluntarily interacting in this new gig economy that was created a real free market exercise, if you will. And you screwed over all the workers that now had to choose between working full time, which the vast majority of them were not. They were coming on after another job or to supplement it or retirees that came on to come on, you know, here or there to kill some time, make a little extra bucks to go on a vacation, whatever it might be. Those people also got screwed over because now the jobs weren't there to be had because they weren't hiring and you now had to choose between A or B. They put it up to a vote. Right, a lobby came together from Uber and all these other ones to put a ballot measure on there that people overwhelmingly supported that said, get rid of your AB5, stick it up your fucking progressive asses. We don't want this shit. Overwhelming support passed. And now a judge has decided that just he is going to overturn that ballot measure, which millions and millions of people voted for, by the way. Judge Frank Roche, an Alameda County Superior Court judge, says that Prop 22, which was the ballot initiative that was passed, is unconstitutional since it interferes with the state legislature's ability to set rules around workers' compensation and collective bargaining. Now, you and I as libertarians, you and I as proponents of the free market, will read that and say that his argument should not even exist. That the legislature having a say over workers' compensation and collective bargaining is something that is an abomination, especially collective bargaining, because that ties into the unionist cronyist bullshit that has overtaken so many states and which free you know, right to work laws and all this other stuff exist to push back upon. But this guy's arguing that this somehow 
supersedes a vote that again was lobbied, was passed, was put on a ballot. This one asshole has now said that he's striking it down. And I don't think it's going to stand, by the way. I think there's no way in hell it stands. He's saying that it that it's limiting the power of the legislature and that now it's going to deride them, or I'm sorry, deprive them of future ability to define at-base drivers as workers subject to workers' compensation laws. And that the entirety of the Prop 22, which recalled and repealed and uh, changed AB5, is unenforceable. I just, the ego on these sons of bitches is shocking. This goes beyond just interpretation of the law into the worst possible, which is judicial activism. And this is a prime example of that. Alameda County, of course, is a very liberal county. Um, that is up where a lot of the uh, big tech are located, right? So you'd think that he'd want to favor these people because a lot of them are probably behind the backbones of it. But still, no, nope. this motherfucker. Screw your millions of votes. And why now? Why now, by the way? Has this guy been suing? I mean, this proposition vote happened months and months and months ago. And these industries still haven't recovered, by the way. Because of the COVID payments, because of the unemployment compensation that's out there, by virtue of saying you can just declare yourself to be unemployed and the government will pay you an obscene amount of money not to work, we still have Ubers that are impossible to find. We still have a lack of drivers across the board. So these industries are still suffering in California. Why now? Why now? <laughs> anyway, it's going to be interesting to see the legal battle that comes from this, uh, where there should be no legal battle, because there should be no authority by the government to be able to force companies into saying, you have to have a full-time employee at this rate when they voluntarily agreed to do it in a different way, while fucking over everybody. This judge, fuck everybody. Fuck the voters, fuck the drivers, fuck the consumers. It's, not, it's rare to get the, the three peep, but this guy did it. God, what a piece of shit. All right, last thing, guys. Last thing, and I'll wrap it up. The Anti-Defamation League, which, of course, is the uh, largest and most influential. Well, I'd say APAC is up there, too, but the Anti-Defamation -Def League, uh, a very powerful organization for pushing Jewish rights and uh, fighting against anti-Semitism. As far as a surface organization, I would argue that they are a political tool in many ways as well. They are partnering with PayPal. PayPal is also partnering with some other organizations, uh, one that is focused on Latin affairs. I'm sure they're partnering with one that's focused on Black Lives Matter affairs. But they're partnering with the ADL in order to fight against extremist communities and protect marginalized communities. They are saying that through this collaboration, they've reached a or they've launched a research effort to address the urgent need to understand how extremists and hate movements throughout the US are attempting to leverage financial platforms to fund criminal activity the intelligence gathered will be shared broadly across the financial industry and with policymakers and law enforcement quote by identifying partners across sectors with common goals and complementary resources we can make an even greater impact than any of us could do on our own said Aaron Karsmer, Chief Risk Officer and EVP of PayPal. We are excited to partner with the ADL, other nonprofits and law enforcement in our fight against hate in all its forms. So that's dangerous and terrifying. And I talked about this before in the wake of the Capital Sixth quote unquote riot. I talked about this in the wake of uh, several other instances wherein you had banking uh, turn on, I mean, Alex Jones is a perfect example, but you had banks say that they would not fund private uh, persons, private companies, because they didn't agree with them politically. This ties in with Joe Biden and his focus on providing the government with partnerships, right? We'll call them partnerships. And this is what he said in his extremist platform, that he is not going to be putting any bills out there, but they're going to be focused on partnering with social media and other private companies in order to combat hate. This is what that looks like. You're seeing it with social media as far as restrictions on what you can and can't say. Uh, they will flag you for using a bad no-no word. They'll flag you for not even using a bad no-no word, but they'll say you were threatening violence or possibly uh, intimidating somebody by you use of a certain word or phrase. Meanwhile, the people on the left do this shit all the fucking time. 
all the time. If you look at the language on the left, it is absolutely violent and intimidating virtually all the time. And they will actually actively try to get you deplatformed and all this other good stuff. Not to say some people on the right don't do it too, by the way, but predominantly you see the left. Oh, that's lovely. Lovely. So <laughs> that's always annoying when that happens. So we now have a situation where Joe Biden is instituted these financial institutions to work with the uh, hate, anti-hate groups. But of course, every anti-hate group has its own motivations. We know that the ADL, right, Anti-Defamation League, is insanely pro-Israel. So what does that mean moving forward? Anybody that has an opinion that is anti-Israel or anti-Israeli government moves, like, for example, me. I think the state of Israel, the citizens of Israel, right, I, I think Israel probably has the right to exist over there. I think that the people of Israel have their rights as individuals, but what they do as far as actions against the Palestinians, actions in the Gaza Strip, I think what they're doing over there is an apartheid state. I think that the blockades they put into place are inhuman. I think that the actions they take are far more violent than need to be. And I think that there is a power imbalance there that is sickening and that the world stage kind of overlooks because, well, you're anti-Semitic if you argue the other way. Are they now going to say that I can't use PayPal anymore? If they see me say that last statement, are they going to tell me that I no longer can bank? Are they talking about, oh, we're going to share our, our influence, our research as PayPal with other banking institutions? Okay, am I going to be cut off from all my credit cards? Am I going to be cut off from my savings accounts? Poisoning the banking and financial industries in regards to politics, in regards to quote unquote hate, which is only political because hate is defined by your subjectivity. What is some person's hate is another person's simple view of the world and of reality. And as we see these influencers come in and social media plays a big part in it, the ADL has a huge social media influence. PayPal, of course, is predominantly on social media instead of the, uh, instead of the typical financial background, I should say. Well, you could see how this is going to be so poisonous and so incendiary to so many people that it's going to ruin, it's going to ruin people's lives. And the only hope that we have is that it's going to create a new free market wherein financial institutions will either reject this flat out or alternatives will come up. The problem then becomes, well, what happens if all the backbones refuse to, you know, with like a parlor, for example, what happens if the technology backbones refuse to accept your transactions, refuse to give you a platform as a banking institution, refuse to allow you to utilize their conduits for processing different, uh, different financial transactions. Well, now what do you have to do? Do we have to start everything from scratch again? I mean, this is a perversion of society that you're seeing right now. This is the attacking from a political basis of the basic ways of life, of operating, even more than COVID fucked you over as far as running your business and be able to operate as a human being. Now you're seeing these people push, these psychopaths push to cancel you, not only from social media, but to cancel your ability to live. And don't make any, don't make any uh, misgivings here. The war on a stable paper currency, a stable you know currency that you can actually hand carry around, that's non-trackable, that's non non-cutoffable. The will and the urge to kill that from the government, from these bank institutions, from these social organizations, is tied in with that. It's not only about tracking you, but it's about making sure that you are good and proper fucked if they want you to be fucked and you can't get around it by having some dollar bills in your mattress. All right, that's it. I'm getting calls from all over the goddamn place. My dog's banging on the fucking back door. Thank you all for listening, guys. Make sure to subscribe to the show. Make sure to listen to us on Patreon. Make sure to check out my other podcast, hilarious podcast, called The Boring Podcast. I do it with Rico. I do it with Odie. I do it with Howie Snowden. And it is dynamite. It's one of the funniest shows you'll ever hear. Some reality TV stuff, a lot of fun and games. We play an amazing show called What's in That Ass, which is like a 20 questions for shit that's stuck into people. And uh, yeah. You're an idiot if you don't listen. All right, guys, for me, Brian McWilliams from the Lions of Liberty and from Electric Liberty Land, always stay plugged in to liberty. Liberty.